Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We are the co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, producing this weekly talk show and working on many other fronts to educate the public about non-theism and the vital need to support the constitutional principle of the separation between state and church. You can join us today, become a member, or ask for more information at ffrf.org. Our guest today, Robert P. Jones, is the CEO and founder of Public Religion Research Institute, known as PRRI. He's a leading scholar and commentator on religion and politics, and he's frequently uh, featured on national media, such as CNN, NPR, The New York Times, and he holds a Ph.D. in religion from Emory University and a Master of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Robert P. Jones is the author of the 2016 book, The End of White Christian America. His newest book, released in 2020, is White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. So, Robert Jones, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. I enjoyed your book. The, the, your book is about religion and, and racism, and the title of the book is White Too Long. Why that title? Well, you know, the title is actually, um, uh, I should give credit here where credit's due. It, it's, it's a quote from James Baldwin. Um, and, you know, I should take just a minute. It, it, it's because it stayed with me so much. It comes from a, a New York Times um, op-ed uh, that he wrote after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And I think he, like King, really held out hope that, that white Americans, and, and in particular white Christians, would ultimately rise up and, and be on the right side of the civil rights movement. And he's writing this, again, just as, as King has been cut down and there has been no great uh, you know, ar arisal from the um, uh, from the white Christian church. And he's writing this in some despair. Um, and I'll read just a little bit, I think, to put it into context. Um, but it's really an indictment um, from James Baldwin of, of white Americans in general. Um, but in his mind, in his writings, you know, he's got white Christians in particular um, in mind here. So this is what he says. Um, I will flatly say that the bulk of this country's white population impresses me and has so impressed me for a very long time as being beyond any conceivable hope of moral rehabilitation. They have been white, if I may so put it, too long. They have been married to the lie of white supremacy too long. The effect on their personalities, their lives, their grasp of reality has been as devastating as the lava which so memorably immobilized the citizens of Pompeii. They are unable to conceive that their version of reality, which they want me to accept, is an insult to my history and a parody of theirs and an intolerable violation of myself. So I think one way of reading the book is, um, you know, is one white Christian's um, uh, attempt to really respond uh, to that fairly devastating um, indictment um, from, from nearly 50 years ago. Yes, it is quite an indictment. <clears throat> and so is the title of your book, you know, White Supremacy in Christian America. So tell us more about that in your own background and what brought you to write this book? Sure. You know, well, I should say a little bit about my, yeah, my own background. So I grew up um, as Southern Baptist, um, evangelical Christian uh, in, in Mississippi. Uh, so come really from inside this world. In the introduction, you, you know, read my bio. And so I, I went to a Baptist college. I have a Master of Divinity degree from um, one of the Southern, big six Southern Baptist seminaries, um, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth. Um, and, but my family's roots go very, very deep, um, you know, six generations back into middle Georgia. Both sides of my family are from middle Georgia. In fact, I'm the, I'm the first generation uh, in uh, more than 200 years to live not in one of two counties um, right outside of Macon, Macon, Georgia. So, you know, so this is a personal book uh, for me that is really about reckoning with my own family's history um, reckoning with, um, you know, my own church uh, th that I grew up in and Christianity um, in, in general. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing to say about the, um, that when we think about the word white supremacy um, and, and, and Christianity, or we hear about church and racial justice, most of the time what people think about are uh, African-American churches that served as hubs of organizing 
uh, for the civil rights movement and were places of you know taking courageous stands and working for the equality of African Americans um, in the country. But very few people um, think when you hear civil rights in church, very few people think of the massive resistance uh, that white Christian churches put up uh, to the civil rights movement. And again, so part of this book is kind of part memoir, uh, part history, and part social science. We're looking at contemporary uh, opinions today, and I wanted to tell a truer history um, of of um, where white Christians, you know, really have been in mass um, on this question of white supremacy in American history. And and since it's sort of personal, what about the history historically of the Southern Baptists and how they came to be? Yeah, well, I think mean, one of the the thing I start the book actually with the history of the Southern Baptist Convention, which again is my home denomination um, growing up. And, and I should say, I mean, I was that kid who was at church like literally five times a week. I was there all the time. Um, you know, I was a leader in the youth group. Uh, you know, I was there. You know, really whenever the doors were open, as many times as five five times a week, uh, 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 pretty often. Uh, so you know, it, it's something very near and and dear to me. Um, and the the thing that I, I recognize is that even having been there that many times throughout my entire um, kind of formative years, I never heard uh, the story of, of the formation of, of the convention until I was in my 20s at seminary. Um, and and it's, it's fairly stark. I mean, the story is um, the reason that the Southern Baptist Convention exists and the reason why it has Southern in its name um, is that in 1845, before the Civil War, um, there was a dispute among Baptists in the North and Baptists in the South, uh, white, white Baptists in the North and white Baptists in the South, over whether it was appropriate for uh, members of the clergy and people who were being appointed uh, uh, to do missionary work uh, to enslave other people. Um, and uh, this, this dispute broke out. The churches in the South insisted um, that this was perfectly consistent with Christian teaching and, and living uh, to enslave other human beings. Uh, and Baptists in the North said, so there wasn't, there was this split. And so 1845, the, the Baptists in the South formed uh, the Southern Baptist Convention explicitly on the principle that enslaving other people on the basis of the color of their skin was perfectly compatible with the Christian gospel. And I think you're right. I don't think very many people in the general public really realize that even today. Yeah. It's worth noting, though, that, that um, you know, this is no, this was no fringe movement, right? Um, that, that, uh, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, starts there, uh, but a hundred years later, it has now it, it grew by the mid 20th century uh, to outgrow um, every other uh, denomination in the country. So by the mid 1950s, it it is and, and through the rest of the 20th century, it is the largest single um, Christian denomination um, in the country. So this this denomination that began with this explicitly uh, uh, kind of white supremacist framework. Uh, you know, grew and flourished in the country so that it became, again, there were 16 million members at its peak in the, in the sort of second half of the, of the 20th century in this single denomination. So it has an outsized influence, not just sort of in the South, but really among white Christianity writ, writ large. So you also point out that it's Methodists and white Catholics and, and Presbyterians and others in the South who were still using the Bible to some degree to justify the ownership of people. But uh, your book is, what I found fascinating is you have on the one hand, a lot of data and facts and surveys and studies and analysis of actual numbers. On the other hand, you tell a lot of stories too. Some of them are heartbreaking stories. But when it comes to data, which is what your group focuses on, how do you tease that out from the white Christian population? How do you know they actually are more racist? Yeah, well, thanks for asking that question. You know, like I said, yeah, we do. The book has a lot of history, a lot of memoir, but um, but I do have, um, you know, my day job at, at PRI. I'm I'm looking at public opinion data and demographic data, um, you know, on a day to day basis. And so, uh, the book is is also grounded in um, quantitative, contemporary research of, of public opinion today. And I think one of the surprising things that I found was how widely diffused. Even today, right, in a, in a survey conducted in 2018 um, uh, is, is, and, and some in 2019, uh, just very, very recent studies still show the imprint of this legacy of white supremacy. I'll give you just a couple of examples here. And in the book, what I did is I looked not only at white evangelicals, which is the group that we've been talking about, but the other two big groups of uh, white Christians that you mentioned, white mainline Protestants, they're more uh, kind of populous in the Midwest, upper Midwest and the Northeast, and white Catholics 
which really have their roots in the urban centers um, uh, of the Northeast. And, and even there, with these very different histories, these very different ge geographical centers of gravity, we found these, these views fairly diffuse. So just a couple of examples. When we ask about, for example, you know, the things we've been watching unfold um, protests, you know, th this year over um, uh, the killing of African Americans by police, when we ask questions about that, uh, we see these massive divides between white Americans who are Christian and those who are not. And that's one of the things I did in the book is look at, um, at whites by religious affiliation. And you just see this enormous gap. And so white Christians, for example, on that question, um, our survey asked whether uh, people thought that the killing of African-American men by police were isolated incidents or were they part of a broader pattern of how police treat African-Americans. Uh, and what we found is that uh, overwhelmingly um, white Christian groups are on that first side. They don't see the connection. They say these are just isolated incidents and make, don't connect the dots be between the two. Um, uh, and whites who are uh, not Christian are much less likely to do that. There's about a 25 point gap between whites who are Christian and whites who are not on that question. And it's not just that question. If we ask about Confederate flags, if we ask about uh, the effects of past discrimination on uh, present inequalities, a whole range of questions. And in fact, in the book, I use 15 different questions. So it's not just cherry picking one question, but this pattern shows up over and over and over again. And when I put them all together in a composite index and kind of score them on a scale of you know one to ten, with ten holding the most racist attitudes, one meaning you hold the least racist attitudes, um, white evangelical Christians score eight out of ten on that scale. But uh, here's what's surprising: is that white mainline Protestants and white Catholics score seven out of ten on that scale, and whites who are uh, religiously unaffiliated, who claim no religious affiliation, only score four. Um, on that scale. So, you know, this pattern is just very, very consistent. And I went one step further uh, to kind of make sure that these, you know, anytime you have a correlation, you have to kind of look to see what other intervening variables there might be. Uh, so, for example, maybe it's just because of higher identity with the Republican Party or a different education level, different region of the country, ed, uh, you know, education, uh, urban versus rural, a whole range of things could impact those uh, those correlations. And um, when I put them in a statistical model to control for all of these things, uh, they barely move. So these these relationships stand up independently. What it means is there's an independent relationship uh, between identifying as a white Christian and holding more racist attitudes, even controlling for partisanship, education, region of the country, et cetera. So, Robbie, since our organization mostly has um, people who are not religious, could you be a little more specific about, you're saying non-Christians are less racist, in, at least in these answers. Did you actually ask about people who are not religious and their views? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's the comparative category that I was using, is, is, uh, is white, whites who do not identify with the religious tradition and comparing them to, to those who identify as Christian. And we see this you know, 25 to 30 point gap on virtually any question we want to ask around race and racism, uh, where as a, as a whole, uh, whites who are not Christian and, and don't aren't religious at all um, are about 30 points less likely uh, to hold racist views on average than whites who are Christian. We so. have to take a break, Robert P. Jones. Robert P. Jones is the founder and CEO of Public Religion Research Institute. His book is called White Too Long. After the break, we want to ask you, uh, what can we do about it? What can white evangelical Christians do about this problem? We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Chris Calvey, and I am proud to be an out-of-the-closet atheist. Atheists are sometimes accused of leading lives that are cold and bleak and meaningless, but that's not the way I see it. To me, I don't believe that there's an afterlife. And that realization that this might be the only chance we have makes my life feel incredibly important every day. Also, knowing that help is not going to come from above 
imparts on me a profound sense of urgency to work together to solve the world's problems and alleviate human suffering. That's why my purpose in life is to try and leave planet Earth a little bit better than it was the way I found it. I'm a graduate student, I'm studying microbiology, and I'm trying to develop renewable biofuels before it's too late. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Robert P. Jones, founder and CEO of Public Religion Research Institute. And before the break, we were talking about how the correlation between Christian views and racism. And you point out that if you take the average white American and add Christianity, it leans them more toward racism. Why is that? What is Christianity doing? or? or where does that come from? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I have a pretty stark sentence in the book where I, I make that conclusion. Um, and, you know, it, it was one I wasn't sure I'd have the, the evidence to, to really make, um, but it's really where the evidence points um, is, is, again, this independent relationship between holding more racist attitudes and identifying as a white Christian in the country. And again, not just in the South, right, but in the Midwest, the Northeast, and among white mainline Protestants and white Catholics, not just evangelicals. So, and this relationship being as robust as it was. Um, you know, but here, I think, is where we have this kind of suppressed history. Um, and if we really understood the history more clearly, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be maybe that surprised uh, by that. And, you know, again, you know, if we think about white Christianity as the dominant cultural force for most of the country's founding, all right, and, and the country has really been, um, you know, uh, uh, really driven by, I think in many ways, you know, this commitment to white supremacy. So who could vote uh, at the beginning of the republic? Um, you know, it was white male landowners, um, you know, and is, is in the, the whole civil rights movement in the 1960s was because, uh, you know, schools were segregated, jobs were segregated, um, where you could live, uh, it was segregated. This is, this is most of our history, right, has been wrapped up with this kind of legal and cultural edifice of white supremacy. Now, who's been propping that up? Um, and, and if you realize that the dominant cultural force in the country has been white Christianity, that is who has been propping up that system, right? And so given that, that white Christianity has been committed uh, to the system and, and really hasn't been incidental to it, but has been part of the legitimation structure, right? Part of the grounding it in a moral and even a divine mandate that this is the way God intended human society to be set up, when we realize that that is the role that white Christianity has so often played, you know, then we kind of move from a question that's like, well, how can that be, um, really, to a question that says, well, well how could it be otherwise, um, given this history? But couldn't it be the Bible itself? I mean, many pastors in the South were using the Bible as a justification. Some, some Southern senators even quoted the scriptures, the Christian scriptures themselves, that were supporting the institution of slavery. Yeah, you know, the, the, the Bible's uh, an interesting, um, you know, way to look at this, because uh, on the one hand, um, you had sort of certainly white Christianity absolutely reading even a different creation story for white uh, people than African-American people into the biblical text, uh, right? That was a pretty standard fare uh, for whites to try and trace their lineage back to Adam and Eve and for uh, them to trace the lineage of all black and brown people uh, uh, to the story of Cain and Abel, like where um, so where um, the character murders his brother, right, and that and that God marks that person, and reading that in as the beginning of race, um, even though the text doesn't say anything about that. But the but on the other hand, you had African Americans drawing on the Bible uh, uh, for themes of liberation, right, from from slavery. So the Bible has served as this kind of you know very elastic document that on the one hand was a tool, absolutely a tool of oppression. Um, uh, by, by, by white Christians uh, in, in this country, but also had been a tool of, of liberation for African Americans. Your book points out that some white supremacist groups actually recruit at church parking lots. Well, he didn't say they did, but he said they could, if they, they could. Oh, I see. You, they could. What if was they that sentence? To. Well, yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll clarify that. Um, the, uh, you know, so again, I was trying to think about just how to distill this research um, you know, into um, very common, plain language um, at the end of the day, and really not mince any words. And so one of the more striking findings in the book um, is uh, the effect of church attendance today um, on, on attitudes. So not way back when, but today, because one of the objectives might be, okay, look, I see this correlation. I, I hear you telling me that it's an independent relationship 
uh, between holding more racist attitudes and identifying as white Christian. But maybe those people who identify as white and Christian, or maybe maybe they're just Christian in name only, right? So maybe they don't go to church, maybe they're not listening to sermons or attending Bible studies, and they're not really being formed in any community. Um, that's an objection I think I often hear, and there's actually some debate about that in, in, uh, in some earlier literature. But when I dug in more deeply, what I found is, at best, among white Christians as a whole, attending church makes no difference. In other words, it doesn't mitigate holding more racist um, attitudes. But among the group of white evangelicals, the group that I, again, that I grew up in, um, what I found is that, in fact, um, at higher church attenders are, hold more racist attitudes, or more likely to hold uh, racist attitudes than those who attend. Uh, more frequently. So in other words, um, uh, if you look at the relationship between holding racist attitudes and identifying as a white evangelical, those that connection is actually stronger among those who attend more frequently rather than less. So I, I kind of tried to distill that down. Um, and I said, so what this means is um, that if, if you were, it was a hypothetical, but if you were a white supremacist um, and you were looking to recruit people on a Sunday morning, you would have a higher percentage of um, success if you hung out in church parking lots uh, than if you hung out at the coffee shop with people who were sitting out church. Well, with former President Trump, we've been hearing a lot about dog whistles, and your book talks about that, like phrases like our heritage or Western civilization. Could you elaborate a bit more about that? We use this language of dog whistles. Um, I, I feel like over the last you know, four years, it's been more like a megaphone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not even that coded. Mm -hmm. Um, um, anymore. It's pretty straight out. So we hear, yes, like our country. Uh, you know, we also hear things like um, that. I, it's built to me they're straight out of, you know, the 1960s, this thing about um, uh, protecting, for example, protecting suburban women mm -hmm. from low income housing and then talking about Cory Booker um, as the person who's going to bring low income housing, um, you know, to to white women in the suburbs. I mean, this is overtly racist. Um, you know, language that we're hearing. But but, but the other language around, yes, uh, we have to pay attention to these pronouns. You know, our, who does he mean um, when we hear the word our? We hear things like um, we're losing our country. Um, you know, they're stealing our country. Our country is never going to be the same. References to Western civilization. I mean, these are all tropes, um, really, of white supremacy. Uh, and talking about um, aversion, if you ask, if you really interrogate that, right, what you really think, what you're really hearing is, these are versions of um, we want to go back to a white Christian America. You know, my last book, I kind of focused on this this problem called the end of white Christian America and that, that the apocalyptic kind of language that we're hearing. And I think one of the reasons why, you know, we're seeing a president who's really uh, has been willing to fight to the death um, over an election he clearly lost um, and why so many of his supporters are going with him, I think, is the sense that the country is going to be lost. Now, who do they mean by the country, right? It is a white Christian country. And there's a sense in which there's a kernel of truth to this, right? That we have literally moved, um, and not in, in the very recent past, in the past decade, we have moved from being a majority, a country that was demographically speaking, a majority white Christian country. And as recently as 2008, 54% of the country identified as white and Christian. That number is 44% uh, today. So there is a real demographic sense in which that shift has taken place. And there's a new reality that the country is, um, you know, living into. And I think that's a lot of the, but we should make no mistake. When we hear um, these 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 things about our country and Western civilization. These are really references to can we turn the clock back to a, a country that's really dominated, um, you know, by by white Christians, both politically, culturally, and demographically. So even though your data points out that there's a correlation between white Christianity and and racism, we do know there are some white evangelicals and Christians who are not people who feel like you this this shame, I guess, or this disconnect, including some of my relatives who are white evangelicals who, who feel the same way. So what can we do? I use the word we. What can we or white Christians do about this problem? How can we change this situation? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked this question. I mean, I think the where do we go from here, you know, question is, is important. And I think it's what's really important, I think, is that this reckoning is happening. Uh, that, so at the end of the book, I talk about two churches actually in Macon, Georgia. Um, that's kind of where my you know my parents are from. Uh, one white, one one black. Um, that is really trying hard to have these conversations um, there. Uh, they've been working over the last seven years um, there, and and have moved beyond. I think you know a kind of a goal of just let's just reconcile and put our arms around each other and be friends, but really reckoning with the history. 
Um, and I think the, the most important thing for white Christians in, in particular is to not aim directly for going straight for reconciliation, because uh, that's that's the kind of reward at the end of, of the journey. Um, you know, but but I think the only way to get there is to move toward uh, justice and repair um, is what I talk about in the book. And so white Christians have really got to be willing uh, not just to say, can we make can we just say things are OK, um, but to really reckon with the damage that's been done, uh, both really to uh, to African-Americans. But I but I, what the real important point, I think, is what this commitment to white supremacy has done to distort white Christianity itself. Right. So to do the internal repair work um, and the external repair work uh, work for justice. And at the end of the day, if, if enough of that work is done, um, reconciliation will come. Do something meaningful to repair the damage is what you're saying. Yeah, and costly. And I think we're seeing some of that, you know, that, for example, I'll give you one quick example. Um, the Episcopal Church um, in New York and Maryland and Texas and some other places is actually setting up multi-million dollar reparations funds um, that is going to be money that's literally leaving the coffers of the Episcopal Church and going to be uh, benefiting uh, the African-American community um, in those areas. And I think it's those kinds of you know things with real costs um, that are going to have to be done um, in order for us to get really anywhere on, on this issue. Well, so, I think our whole country needs to do reparations, but church is doing it. That's wonderful. And a public apology yeah. is, is not enough. Well, we're out of time, Robert P. Yeah. Jones. Thank you so much for your time today and for your book. And your work. And thank, oh, thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.